I'm not usually one to go back and play the downloadable content of a game that I've already finished. Once I beat a game, generally that's it for me, as my huge backlog of games dictates the amount of time that I can spare toward this hobby. However, sometimes I do come across titles that leave me wanting more, after the main game has been completed. And I don't mean extra in terms of things to find, or bosses to conquer, I mean more story to sink my teeth into, as the characters and world may have more to offer. Such was the case with The Witcher 3. The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt and the first DLC Hearts of Stone were so critically acclaimed that it was a no-brainer that I'd want to tackle the final DLC, Blood and Wine. If you've watched my previous two videos, you may have noticed that I was suffering some serious Geralt burnout due to the density of quests and the large area of land that had to be traversed in order to complete said quests. However, recently I had a slight tickle which quickly turned into a burning desire to return to the world forced into its state from a conjunction of spheres, where more adventure awaited. Originally released as the final DLC to The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt, Blood and Wine serves more as an expansion than a DLC, sheerly from the amount of content that it has to offer to the player. Arriving across multiple platforms in May of 2016, the newest and final DLC for CD Projekt Red's Witcher series promised to be something special. But was it? Let's find out. Blood and Wine sees us adventuring to the land of Tucson, a vassal state of Nilfgaard untouched by war. As such, the contrast between this land and those we travelled before is extreme. Whilst monsters that require extermination do roam its countryside, much of the land is hospitable due to its distance from the fighting. A mirror of southern France, you'll encounter endless stretches of vineyards, blessed by the sun-kissed blush of the horizon at sunset. Order is kept in these lands by the Knights Errant, a group of vassal knights loyal to the Duchess of the city of Beauclair. Geralt's arrival to these verdant lands comes via personal invitation from the Duchess herself, Anna Henrietta, as someone is killing off prominent members of her senior knights, one by one. It becomes Geralt's duty to track down the perpetrator, using his keen witcher senses, as there seems to be no end to the trail of death that leads closer and closer to the head of state. The region of Tucson is vast and equal in scale to Skellige, or the Velen and Novigrad regions, allowing exploration for any that seek the bounty of adventure. Not only is there a new main scenario quest to complete, but Geralt can also take on side quests, monster contracts, as well as hunting treasure. Points of interest riddle the land with sights to behold, and whilst this was one aspect of the main game that really tired me, this time around there is more reason to seek these out. Many of them are tied to side quests, so you can acquire rewards in addition to what you would normally obtain from clearing these objectives. In addition, there are new types of points of interest such as those that see you rescue people connected with the construction of a statue of the prophet Lebioda, or clearing out old cave networks so that they may be used by merchants as wine cellars. Then there are the Hansers, which are large bandit settlements that you must infiltrate in order to exterminate a bandit leader. Be careful though, as if you get spotted, a torchbearer will run to light a beacon. If they accomplish this task before you dispatch them, then the bandit numbers will grow and swarm you like ants, of which you, or your computer's RAM, are most likely not going to survive, even despite your best equipment and witcher signs. As a whole, I felt that Blood and Wine was extremely well put together, seeing Geralt dive into the realm of vampires that inhabit the land. As the player, you may have preconceived notions about this race due to Bram Stoker or perhaps thanks to Stephanie Meyer, who may have helped you through your teenage angst. Nonetheless, it's worth approaching this topic with an open mind, as vampires in The Witcher do not act or operate in the same way. Not only will you meet a prominent member of the Vampire Clan, who is also a friend of our hero, but you'll get to delve into some of their past and learn about their desires to leave the world when the next conjunction happens. Geralt's quest will see him attending a masquerade, where he can partake in frivolous events, attempt to lift the curse on a creature that has a penchant for collecting spoons, as well as journey through a magic realm conjured entirely from the fairy tales that we know and love from our childhood. Though I advise to step into this fabled land gently and with caution, as the depictions of beloved characters and their fates are not at all alike to the stories that we heard while sitting in our grandmother's lap. Despite the land being more welcoming and somewhat hospitable, and the witcher profession seeming to be more respected, 
at least by Anna Henrietta herself, the people that Geralt encounters are no less cruel in the way that they interact with him. People still make snide comments, spit at Geralt's feet, and cats hiss, just like they did in other regions. It's strange because the monsters in this region are of the highest level yet, and pose much more of a threat in numbers than what those in previous lands did. Completely opposite to how the books postulate that monsters are dying out, and with them the Witcher profession. You'd think that with enemies being so high level and so many in number, that the people would respect Geralt's profession and want him to help exterminate them, but I guess when you're drunk on wine, who gives a fuck? Despite the vapid reception that Geralt often encounters, there are some kind souls that he can engage with that will provide a more heartwarming experience, sometimes even comedic, such as locating the balls of a statue of Reginald de Aubrey that were unceremoniously chipped off to be used as a sexual aid. Oh, and I cannot leave off this section without mentioning that Karen exists, even in Tucson. Who'd have thought? I don't the hear gods have sent the wine and small wine as punishment me, for our that. sins! A little into the quest, Geralt will be gifted with a vineyard of his own that also contains an estate that is able to be upgraded with cash that you might happen to have lying around. Unfortunately for me, my Geralt was broke, so in order to get cashed up, I went back to previous areas of the game and completed all the side quests and contracts that I had neglected to finish previously because I had become so burnt out by the game. By completing these, I was able to completely upgrade the property's grounds, exterior and interior, even giving Roach a barn to keep dry in. One thing that I really enjoyed was that there is a quest that, if completed in the correct way, allows you to offer a room in your home to someone who will then become a cook and look after the estate for Geralt when he is away in gratitude. I liked this a lot. If you happen to like Gwent, then Blood and Wine adds a fifth faction to the fray, Skellige, replete with new abilities that can be used to turn the tides of battle. I enjoyed going through the region and collecting all the unique cards and then using them to try and win the big tournament of the region. Some of the new card effects can be quite powerful too, such as the Berserk ability which adds strength to all cards that have a bear mark on them, or a Phoenix-like card that will come back as a more powerful card when it is discarded from play. I must admit that I spent far more time playing Gwent across the region than I probably should have, but it is just so damn addictive that it couldn't be helped. Blood and Wine offers some enhancements to combat in the form of further increasing the potency of Geralt's mutagens, offering him new skills on the battlefield. Whilst there were some that looked appealing, I never actually activated any of them, as they required two skill points and a specific mutagen to utilise. As the game wasn't really that difficult, I didn't feel a need to use any of these. Speaking of combat, the typical cycle of slash roll slash is still intact, with little new strategy needed to combat most of the foes. However, there are some exceptions. For example, the new enemy Shalmar requires a little thought to defeat it as its armor casing is not easily penetrated by even the sharpest of silver. I was also pleasantly surprised to see a return of enemies from the first Witcher title, such as the Bargast and the Giant Centipedes, as it was a little strange that these foes didn't really appear again since the first game, almost as if they had gone extinct. I was happy to see them return. At no point during the game did I need to use potions or oils, with the sole exception of the final boss, which proved to be far more difficult than anything Geralt had ever faced before, whose difficulty was appropriately aligned with the lore of the world. I did appreciate this despite the number of times that I had to redo the battle in order to complete it, without Geralt having his intestines ripped out. From a point of aesthetics, I appreciated that the Tucson region appeared distinctly different from the other regions that we had previously visited. I especially liked the bloom of orange that embraced land every sunset or sunrise that painted the landscape like a renaissance artist. Characters of royal bearing have a more pristine look to them compared to their counterparts in Skellige or Novigrad, which contrasted the cultures and their sensibilities. And some of the equipment Geralt can obtain looks really nice. I know he is not a fashionista, but it pays to look decent when trying to negotiate a greater pay. As usual, musically, you'll hear the earthly chorus of childbearing women crying out when Geralt is in the midst of battle or exploring a mysterious ruin. Light motives found in tracks present within the main game snake a byline through some of the new tracks to tie them into the world. My favourite track of Blood and Wine is called Vivian, named after the cursed woman who Geralt attempts to help near the start of his foray into Tucson. The calming yet aching wailing echoes of the loneliness of Vivian and sets the resolve of Geralt to help her. Just in general, all music in the game fits the scenarios that they play in. If you are looking for a satisfying conclusion to the adventures of Geralt, then you need not look any further than Blood and Wine, with its plethora of unique quests, characters, and a strong narrative that will see you protecting the very city that has taken Geralt in. 
Whilst fundamentally the combat is no different from what we've already experienced, the gripping narrative is enough to keep the most dedicated Witcher fan on track. The addition of a ton of side quests and new places of interest will keep you engaged for at least another 20 to 30 hours, which is an achievement in and of itself where DLCs are concerned. If you're on the fence about whether or not to play this game, I'd say take the plunge. Plunge that stake into the heart and slake that thirst. The thirst for blood and wine. By the way, Western made RPGs tend to feature on my channel irregularly compared to their Japanese counterparts. As such, I would like to know if there are any other Western RPGs you'd like to see me cover. Let me know in the comments. This has been Venwa with a review of the final DLC of The Witcher 3, Blood and Wine. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe for more great Western RPG content. As always, thanks for taking the time to watch this video till the end. I hope to see you next time, take care of yourselves, and bye bye for now.